This is uh, an executive summary of a uh, guardianship webcast that was uh, done uh, yesterday, uh, April 22nd. And this one will be half an hour compared to uh, the 75 minutes of the original. So we hope that people will, uh, that uh, couldn't attend as well will be able to take part. Um, our law practice uh, deals with uh, assisting families with disabilities and special needs in all sorts of ways. Uh, wills, trusts, taxes, uh, guardianship, applic ODSP applications, appeals, probate uh, inheritances that would disqualify people from ODSP and so on. Uh, but the topic this evening, today, is uh, legal guardianship and power of attorney. Primarily legal guardianship, but, we, but we'll start by addressing power of attorney and the, uh, the context of the, the whole situation. Um, you can see here on this slide, and you'll receive copies of, uh, of these slides, that uh, <clears throat> there are approximately one family in 10 in, in the province of Ontario has a, uh, a, has a child between 18 and 65 who has uh, disabilities or special needs. There are 378,000 in total, uh, not including the children under 18 or the seniors over 65. And you can see here that uh, approximately 19%, 20% have uh, developmental disabilities, and that a further 43% have uh, psychoses or neuroses. Uh, I'm not sure, I'm not being flippant here, I'm not sure where, uh, where autism would fit into this. It's a substantial group. Uh, it's not a developmental disability in that sense. Uh, could have you know, a cognitive impairment, that's possible. But you can see here that um, if you look at only the developmental disability side, and if only half of them, so let's say 10%, uh, are sufficiently uh, developmentally delayed to um, not be able to understand and appreciate decision-making that would affect them and harm them potentially, uh, that's um, approximately 37, 38,000 uh, people. And that's only half of those with developmental disabilities between the ages of 18 and 65. Does not include people with um, mental health issues that may be cognitively impaired. Apparently doesn't cover autism. Um, and it also wouldn't cover anyone who has a dual diagnosis where they're categorized under uh, nervous system issues, Parkinson's, for example, uh, which could also certainly have cognitive disabilities. So this is a much downplayed number. Uh, but this is the, uh, uh, the audience, the, uh, the community in Ontario that we assist. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the first question is uh, always, what is the difference between a power of attorney and a legal guardianship? A power of attorney is uh, a document signed by someone who's legally competent, which grants someone else, their attorney, not a lawyer, that's a common mis miscalculation, uh, their attorney, uh, the power to handle and assist them with their property and their personal care. Uh, it can be revoked as long as you're competent to revoke it. Um, a legal guardianship is an application to the court to appoint legal guardians granted by the court uh, after there are uh, uh, capacity assessments and uh, a full uh, factum, a full, mem full uh, weighty ring bound document is submitted to the court along with affidavits and requests and orders uh, that is granted, an order that is finally granted by the court to appoint guardians. And uh, Diane will go into this further. And uh, Dan will go into the uh, assessment process. <coughs> I'd like to say uh, two things before uh, they take over. One is that when you're looking at, co at uh, cognitive ability, competence, uh, if you were to look at it, as a um, horizontal and vertical line, X is uh, 
vertical and y is horizontal. And uh, there is a mathematical name for these two lines. I was told in a seminar one time that one of those lines is called the abscissa, but no one's ever told me what the other one's called. So if anyone does know, please let me know. Some, surely there's some high school math teacher that can tell me. Um, but what it comes down to is if um, the horizontal line is uh, complexity and the vertical line is cognitive ability, if you have the cognitive ability to deal with the complexity of a given situation, choice, well, then you have competence to deal with that issue. And I think it's fair to say that with all of us, as time goes by, or based upon our, uh, our just native intelligence, there are things that we perhaps are not the most competent people to make decisions on. We seek advice. I know I do. But for the most part, there's an accepted standard, which uh, Dan will speak about. But we try to maintain powers of attorney as the option of first choice, wherever we can. The issue that arises is that a lot of times the parents, while alive, can, can get people, doctors, banks, RDSP, you know, issuers, to, uh, to hang their hat on a power of attorney. Uh, but then when they're gone, often the, the siblings of the child with special needs um, aren't as fortunate. They're questioned much more. They go into the bank, you know, they're trying to set up an account that is joint with them and their sister. And the bank manager looks at the sister and says, you know, clearly this, this power of attorney you brought to me is not uh, valid. That's when you have an issue. And that's the situation where the parents uh, have to decide, well, is this something that we should address now? Or do we leave this for our daughter to sort out when we're gone? which you certainly could do. I would say most families that uh, address this look at doing it sooner than later. Uh, but of course, uh, everyone makes their own, their own choice. Uh, and you'll find that, uh, sometimes you'll find that there is a uh, philosophical, that's a kind word, ideological approach by some people that um, if you uh, you're somehow taking something away by having a court confirm that someone is not competent and appointing guardians to make sure that they're properly cared for, and that uh, you should be able to get along with uh, guided decision making for people that uh, have limited abilities. Uh, that's an interesting ideological approach. Um, all I know is that uh, we act for parents who have acted all of their lives in the best interest of their child 24-7 uh, until the day they die. And it's uh, comical, you know, we submit these things <laughs> to the, for the review of the public guardian and trustee, because you have to do that every time. And uh, in some cases, the child has uh, built up a reasonably sizable uh, RDSP. And of course, most of it is grants and bonds that if you collapsed it, uh, they're not vested, they'd go back to the government, you know, and then there's the family contributions. And the PGT often tries to uh, oblige the family uh, to have a, uh, uh, a guardian's bond or uh, to have uh, passing of accounts every three years, which involves lawyers and accountants and fees and, and so on. And uh, so what... Uh, what we do, what Diane does, is points out to the PGT that, uh, that the money that's in that RDSP was contributed by the parents. You know, this is the sort of the practical disconnect that we get in some of these cases. And uh, the way I like to explain this at uh, my seminars is that the parents are the experts. You know, the, all of the doctors and social workers and supporting professionals and all of those uh, like-minded people like lawyers, um, if you compare all of those uh, professional supports and the family's involvement in that child's life, if you look at it in the context of an egg and bacon breakfast, the chicken's involved, but the pig's committed. And that's just a simple fact. And sooner uh, other people figure that out and take it into account and give families the respect that they deserve, uh, the, the quicker the world would be a happier place. Uh, so that's my rant for the day.
Uh, Diane, can I turn it over to you now to talk about uh, process and, and Dan to talk about uh, assessments and so on? Yeah, I'd be happy to talk about that. So my name is Diane and I am one of the lawyers here at Ken Pope's office. Um, I'm just gonna talk very briefly about what the process looks like. You know, when I get that initial first phone call, uh, usually there's a triggering event. So when I say triggering event, maybe it's, you know, a young family that has a child with disabilities who is um, uh, a new adult, so they've turned 18, and now the family is finding a lot of barriers to um, their way of life and the way they were making decisions for their child with disabilities. For example, maybe they're finding it harder to access information for their child, um, maybe to sign on behalf of their child, or to maybe schedule even a simple doctor's appointment or dentist appointment for their child, because now their their child is a, a young adult now. I also get families uh, calling me who um, are anticipating that these types of challenges are going to come about. So their child is not maybe is not 18 yet, but they are 17 and they're turning 18 pretty soon. Uh, sometimes there isn't a triggering event. So um, I do get calls from parents who are older. They've been the main caregiver for their, their child who is uh, maybe in their 50s or 40s now, but has disabilities. But in order to have that peace of mind, these parents wanna pursue guardianship and maybe add another younger relative, like a sibling or an aunt and uncle or a cousin who knows their, um, their family member their, who has disabilities, maybe has grown up with them. Um, and they, they apply and they make it a joint guardianship so that when they pass on, the guardianship is not terminated and continues. Um, last night when we were doing the, the webinar, we did get a lot of questions about uh, people wondering what happens when we pass, when we're parents and we pass away, does the guardianship continue? And no, it doesn't. It has, it, it's only appointed, um, guardianship is only appointed through court or through statute. So basically, it just comes down to having peace of mind. Their child or loved one probably cannot sign a power of attorney document, and there is no other alternative besides guardianship in order to get legal authority to make decisions for that person. Guardianship is a way to provide those with disabilities a voice when they're not capable. I'm getting a lot of phone calls um, with this COVID-19 emergency as well um, from families who are worried about their loved ones with disabilities, who don't live with them, who have limited communication skills. Um, these families don't have guardianship over these people. And our families want to be able to ensure that they will have the final say about their care. When the clients are ready to proceed, we get the retainer signed, then we start gathering all the documents we need for the, the application record. Um, the type of guardianship application we do is called a summary disposition application. And it's a basket application. It's a hearing that is read in writing. So there is no court appearance at all. What we include in this application are plans to manage the allegedly incapable person's property, plans to manage the allegedly incapable person's personal care matters. We have to include medical evidence as to their incapacity. So that's where the capacity assessments come in. We also include consents of immediate family members. So immediate family members means the incapable person, the allegedly incapable person's uh, spouse, if they have one, child, if they have children, if they have one, um, brothers or sisters, and their parents. So uh, let's see what happened. Okay, so um, we communicate with capacity assessors and we uh, coordinate the meetings for the assessors to come and meet uh, with the allegedly incapable person and assess their capabilities. When we're ready to file, 
um, we take this 100 to 200 page document, we, we um, submit it to court, and a copy is given to the immediate family members of that person, it's given to the applicants, it's given to the allegedly incapable person, and also a copy is given to the public guardian and trustee's office. Um, yesterday there was a question about what is the role of the public guardian and trustee. Um, under legislation, they have to review every single guardianship application. There's a small fee, uh, but we put reasons in our application why that fee should be waived, uh, especially because the person who with disabilities uh, is receiving very little income monthly. Um, when the public guardian and trustee receives this application, uh, usually their questions back to us are about uh, financial matters. Essentially, they just want to make sure that no financial abuse is, is happening with that person. Uh, the court judge also may have some questions as well. Um, but, you know, when the, when he or she is satisfied, then the judgment is signed, and then we receive the judgment back at our office, and then a copy and copies are given to the clients. We had a few questions about fees yesterday, court uh, fees for the guardianship application. There are our legal fees. Uh, there's the court fees. Right now, the court fee application is two hundred and twenty-nine dollars. There's a public and guardian trustees fees, which I talked about earlier. That's $250 plus HST. And then there are capacity assessor fees. And remember, we're dealing with two capacity assessors and they're um, going to be making assessments each. Now what I wanna talk about next is uh, the guardianship process during this COVID-19 emergency. Um, the short answer, the the main question is, can we still apply? Can you still proceed with these guardianship assessments I mean, and, and applications? And the answer is yes. So uh, we have been proceeding with non-urgent guardianship applications. Um, the main difference between uh, what's happening now and, what, and uh, previously, uh, we can submit everything electronically. We can serve all the parties electronically. Um, when we get the judgment, it will be an electronic judgment. But when the courts resume back to normal, uh, there is a promise, an undertaking that we have to submit the original documents to the court, uh, have to make the payments to the court that's owed, and um, we'll also be able to pick up the original judgment when things go back to normal. Uh, another thing that has changed, just with respect to uh, the COVID-19 emergency, are the ways power of attorneys can be signed. So now they, uh, the witnesses don't have to be um, in the presence of the, the person who is making the, the power of attorney document. They can sign virtually, um, except another uh, condition is that one of the witnesses has to be uh, licensed by the Law Society. And um, this emergency order that allowed all of this virtual and remote um, witnessing actually is supposed to expire today, but I, I expect that it will be uh, renewed and extended. So um, you know, if there's any other questions about uh, the guardianship process, feel free to send me an email. And then um, Dan, if it's okay with you, I think uh, I'll um, hand it over to you now to talk about uh, capacity assessors. And All right. assessments. Thanks very much for uh, asking me to join you today. Before we get started, I'd like to say a few words about a topic that's seen some heated discussions as the processes have changed with the requirements of social distancing in the state of emergency. The topic is virtual assessments and in-person assessments. So there have been a lot of questions as to why capacity assessors haven't been more active during the recent state of emergency. And this is the short explanation. The province has deemed capacity assessors as a non-essential service provider. Although a viable workaround is thought to be the use of virtual platforms for conducting assessments, this is an unprecedented method without regulated or legislated guidelines. In the future, I'm sure there, there will be, but there are not regulated or legislated guidelines right now. For this reason, the quest, any questions about virtual assessments should be directed to the capacity assessment office. 
with the consideration for conducting face-to-face -face assessments and having been informed by the province that capacity assessment services are a non-essential service, capacity assessors on their own must consult their own regulatory body and weigh the specific details of risk of harm to self and the client when deciding if an in-person assessment is to take place. <clears throat> so the short of that is that in-person assessments can take place. Next, the information that I'm sharing today is intended for families and caregivers, and so it is first and foremost intended to be practical. The first question I'm going to answer is, when should a capacity assessment be, cons be considered? And the answer is, a capacity assessment should be considered when the alleged incapable person doesn't understand or appreciate how to manage their property. And understand can also be taken to mean have knowledge of as well as understanding of their financial resources. This element of the assessment speaks to more than whether the person has basic financial literacy. It's important to remember that we are legally permitted to be bad financial managers of our property. So this is when an assessment should be considered. One, if the person doesn't understand their sources of income and expenses. Two, if the person doesn't understand the nature of the financial decisions and the various choices available to him or her. Three, if the person doesn't understand his relationship to the parties and or potential beneficiaries of the transactions or the transactions which give rise to the decision. And four, if the person doesn't appreciate the consequences of making the decision as well as the consequences of choosing not to make a decision. For example, if a person knows that they receive a disability pension and the approximate amount, and they also know the approximate amount of rent they pay and the approximate amount of money remaining for food and other basic necessities, then they understand. The next element and more complicated element of the test is to determine if they appreciate the consequences of mismanagement. And I'll speak more about that in a minute. The next question is, what are the assessment criteria? The answer is, does the person understand the information necessary to manage their property and or personal care? And do they appreciate the consequences of mismanagement? If they don't have a basic grasp of the information, can they learn it? That's the question, can they learn it? If they do have a basic grasp of the information necessary to manage their property, even if they're directing someone else to do the work, then they do understand it. Note that the complexity of the estate is always taken into consideration here. More on that later too. If they don't have a basic grasp of the information and it might be possible for them to learn it, have they been provided an opportunity to learn it? If not, they should be given that opportunity, whether it's a couple of lessons or it's one or two weeks worth of, worth of coaching, and then they should be assessed at a later time. If the opinion is that the person doesn't understand, then the opinion will be that they are incapable. If the opinion is that the person does understand, the assessor then moves on to determine if the person appreciates the consequences of mismanagement. The appreciation test is a bit trickier because in our society, people are permitted to be bad managers. We've all heard stories about people who've inherited fortunes or won the lottery and dwindled it away. If they understand the possible outcomes being the consequences of losing their money, that doesn't make them incapable. We don't lock up people who push their property around in a shopping cart and we can't seize the legitimately managed monies of venture capitalists who don't break the law. Here's a personal example. I still have control over all of my property even though my, 90 year, my 91 year old father strongly recommended that I not invest in a certain marijuana stock. He showed me his 10 page analysis with charts and graphs and language and quotes from, from annual reports. I still went ahead and invested and I lost $8,000 when trading was halted on the TSC and the New York exchange as well. I should listen to my father more often. However, um, I, I'm okay, I knew what the consequences were, so I still have the power to manage my own property. Having said all this, we are allowed to be bad managers if we understand the inputs and outputs and the consequences should we lose. It's important to consider the following questions when assessing a person. Now, taking into consideration everything that, that's led up to this point in my little talk, it's important to consider the following questions. 
does the person suffer from delusions or hallucinations that will affect their understanding and management of their finances? Two, is the person oriented to time, place, and person? Three, is the person's memory sufficiently intact so as to allow the person to keep track of financial matters and decisions? Four, is the person's calculating ability sufficient in the circumstances given the complexity of their estate? Five, does the person suffer from specific thought process deficits that give rise to the conclusion that deficits in financial judgment exist? For example, speech or brain injury that leads to difficulty comparing possible outcomes. Six, does the person have the capacity to learn skills necessary to make the sorts of decisions required in an estate of the size, nature, and complexity that he or she possesses? This is particularly important because there's a higher bar for people who have complicated financial investments versus a person living on a small fixed income. There's a precedent that speaks to this. The example is, if I have an income of $1,400 a month and a history of homelessness, have been financially exploited on the streets and frequently hospitalized, a guardian or a POA is likely a good idea. But if I'm living in a supported living community and my rent is paid, let's say I've moved to a new supported living community, I'm no longer living rough on the streets or, or surfing couches or uh, having apartments and, and, and moving frequently, and I've moved to a supported living community and my rent is paid direct, the consequences of mismanagement are much lower than when I was on the street, hence the opinion would likely be capable in the second scenario. I always ask myself, are the answers I'm hearing during the assessment reasonably consistent with past actions? And if they're not, what's changed? If something's changed and given, and given rise to a different pattern of financial management, can the person offer a reasonable explanation? If they can, the opinion will likely be capable. Okay, so that was Assessing Property 101. Now, a little bit about personal care. With regard to assessing personal care, six domains are assessed. Each receives an opinion of capable or incapable. All domains are important, but I pay special attention to the six in this order. Safety, health care, nutrition, shelter, clothing, and hygiene. Keep in mind that the questions, the examples I'm gonna share with you in a minute uh, are, are just examples for today's conversation. I don't ask all these questions to every person. I pick questions based on background information that has been collected in advance of meeting the person. Safety, the first domain. Is he aware of predators in the environment? Would he know to not walk away with a stranger? Would he know to fear a growling dog? Could he find his way home if he was separated from a group in a shopping mall? Is he safe to go walking on the sidewalk in his neighborhood? Can he swim? Is he safe to use kitchen gadgets and help prepare food in the kitchen? Is he likely to wander into the garage and at risk if he picks up a battery operated reciprocating saw? Healthcare. Does the person know what the medication is for and how it can help and potentially be harmful if misused? Can she take her own meds or do they need to be presented to her in whole form or crushed and put into her food? Can she tell you if she's sick or are, her be or are the, there behavioral signs which are only interpreted by those who know her well? Can she explain to the doctor what the issues are or does someone else have to explain for her? Does she need to be motivated to engage in her activities of daily living? The next domain is nutrition. Does he know to manage his food intake or are the portions prepared for him? Does he make healthy choices or are the choices made for him? Can he use utensils or does he prefer finger foods? Is he conscious of the importance of exercise? The next domain is shelter. Can she do some, many, or none of the standard household chores that an independent adult does in a routine week? Would she know to manage an ant infestation? And if not, would she know to inform someone who could deal with it? Similarly, would she know to inform someone if there was a water leak from the roof to an interior room in the house? Does she know to lock the doors to the house? The next one is clothing. Does he dress himself? Does he know to change his clothes if he gets very dirty? Would his clothes match if he did it on his own, if he, if, if he got dressed on his own? 
Does he dress appropriately for the weather so as to avoid freezing or heat exhaustion? Would he know to use an umbrella if it was raining? Can he tie his shoes or does he use Velcro because he hasn't been able to learn? Can he launder his own clothes? Can he put his own clothes away? Does he require hand over hand guidance to participate in dressing and or other activities that he participates in? And the final domain is hygiene. Does she shower, toilet, brush teeth, wash, wash her face, etc., independently, or does she require hand over hand support? Can she use feminine hygiene products appropriately or does she need assistance? Now, that's a short summary of what we look at for personal care. And I remind you that, that uh, following the document review and initial conversations with the requester, the questions are tailored to the individual. Uh, some people have asked about the process uh, from the capacity assessor's uh, uh, role. So here's the short answer. If it's not a guardianship, the assessor will always ask for an explanation as to why the assessment is necessary and the answer will help to clarify if an assessment is actually necessary and if so the type of assessment because there are many. With guardianships which is what we're here to talk about tonight a requester will contact a lawyer who will require two assessments. The lawyer will usually already have collected all the necessary background medical reports but if not the assessor will just ask for all available medical reports and collateral contacts that can help to answer the financial and the biopsychosocial questions that we've uh, discussed above uh, previously. The document review can sometimes be a large part of the assessment. However, it's very important to remember that the most important part of the assessment is the face-to-face -face interview. For your information, that's why virtual interviews can be so complicated. The assessor will then schedule an assessment day and time uh, when the assessed person is at their best. I can't underestimate the importance of conducting the face-to-face -face assessment when the person is at their best. They need, to be given, they need to be given that opportunity to put their best foot forward. Prior to beginning the assessment, the assessor must know if accommodations are required. So in advance of the assessment, we also need to know if an interpreter is required and if so, uh, what kind of interpreter, uh, sign or language, and then we arrange for it. If there are other communication issues, we need to know if they have, well, for example, we need to know if they have limited vocabulary, and if so, which words they understand. A vocabulary list can be helpful. A whiteboard might be helpful, or if they can nod in the affirmative and negative, or squeeze fingers or blink for yes or no. It's good to know that in advance. We also have to give a rights advice when it's a voluntary assessment. We have to ask if they can hear us, if they can see us. They need to be informed that it's a voluntary assessment, the potential outcomes, and that they have a right to refuse. If they refuse, the assessment stops right there, unless it's a court-ordered assessment. Next question. What happens after the assessment is complete? If the assessment is for guardianship, the two assessments are provided to the lawyer representing the requester and used with other material to support the case for guardianship. And just so that you're aware, there are numerous forms of assessments, some of which go to the assessed person, a lawyer, a court, the POA, or the public guardian and trustee. Next question is how to choose an assessor. Well, uh, first thing is your lawyer may recommend someone in particular. They may have worked with someone, trust them, and um, have, just have a good relationship. And so, uh, you know, it's just going with your lawyer's advice. However, there is a provincial list of assessors that is on the public guardian and trustees website. You should know that some assessors will travel a distance and others just want to stay close to home. Assessors have specialties, so you need to pick accordingly and assessors are self-employed, so prices will vary. All right, having said that, um, uh, if there are any questions that are still outstanding that I might ask that were presented last night, let me know and I'll do my best. Well, I think that was excellent. Thank you very much. Um, does anyone have any closing comments? Uh, we'd be happy to answer questions. You can see on the, on the screen the uh, the contact information for email. And uh, we had um, 464 people register for the, uh, the longer webcast last night. Uh, this uh, will be sent out to all of those and uh, along with the PowerPoint slides. 
And if anybody wants to discuss things further, we're happy to speak with them. Uh, that said, I think that's about 30 minutes. And uh, thank you very much.